Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today for the first of the spring semester seminar presentations hosted by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. My name is David Mirhadi, and I am the chair of the Department of Global Humanities, and I'll be responsible for moderating today's talk. I am pleased to present today's speaker from our own Department of Global Humanities, Dr. Spiro Safos. Dr. Safos' research explores the intersection of societal insecurity, identity and collective action, and to date, it has focused on Turkish politics and society, nationalism and populism in Europe and the Middle East, European Muslim identities and politics, and the theory of populism. His publications include Turkish Politics and the People, Mass Mobilization and Populism, Islam in Europe, Public Spaces and Civic Networks, Tormented by History, Nationalism in Greece, and Turkey co -author, uh, authored with Umut Okirimdi, and Nation and Identity in Contemporary Europe. Spiros initiated a project, Rethinking Populism, originally in partnership with Open Democracy, uh, and is its lead editor. I hope you will enjoy today's presentation from Spiros of Us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, thank you everybody for, everybody for being here. Um, yes, I would like to start with a, a short introduction. I'll try to situate populism, uh, especially uh, the phenomenon of populism in Greece in a historical context. And uh, then I will try to situate the populism of the 1980s associated with PASOK uh, uh, to its uh, historical context as well. So uh, let me start by first of all saying that uh, 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 populism has been mentioned uh, particularly uh, um, in Greece with reference to the emergence of uh, a party that has become a textbook case of populism, Syriza. Uh, this uh, was uh, in many ways the outcome of the uh, economic crisis in Greece in uh, the beginning of the century that uh, um, uh, prompted Greece to uh, uh, seek the aid of the European Union and the International Mon Monetary Fund. And uh, 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 the result of this uh, aid was uh, a quite, I would say, punitive agreement that uh, uh, forced uh, Greece to introduce policies of austerity and at the same time uh, to privatize uh, uh, public resources, uh, public goods. Uh, this uh, unexpected, I would say, turn of events, especially after the euphoria that the Olympics of, the two of 2004 had brought, uh, has uh, 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 created, uh, first of all, um, a, uh, I would say, uh, an uproar among the population that eventually uh, took the concrete form of indignation. Uh, actually, uh, the movement that was established at the time in the streets were called the, the Aganaktismeni, which means the indi indignant citizens. Um, I won't go into, into the details of this. I would like to say that out of this indignation, this uh, ambient indignation, uh, a, a number of uh, political parties emerged, while the traditional political parties uh, uh, were uh, so the, the share of the vote uh, really collapsed. So one of these parties was uh, Syriza, uh, the product of that indignation, I would say, and uh, the shock of uh, citizens in Greece. Uh, but also, I would say, on the right, the right side of the political spectrum, also we had uh, uh, beneficiaries of this indignation, primarily the uh, neo-fascist party, Golden Dawn, and uh, uh, Syriza's partner in government, uh, Anexartity Elinus. However, I would uh, say that uh, uh, this emphasis on Syriza as uh, an exemplar of a populist party and uh, its politics as uh, a case of populist politics uh, in many ways overshadowed uh, a, a developments in Greece that took place in the 1980s. This is an arbitrary date, of course, because they were already under 
in some ways uh, underway in, this, in the 70s. Uh, and uh, I am talking primarily about the emergence of uh, a socialist political uh, movement, PASOK, that also became at the time a textbook, a, a case of uh, populism. Mm -hmm. Uh, there has a lot has been written about PASOK, so I'm not uh, trying to uh, reproduce what uh, has been uh, already said in the literature, although occasionally I will make references to it. But uh, I would like to uh, look at the conditions that made the emergence of PASOK possible and in many ways that uh, contributed to the success of uh, PASOK as a populist movement. PASOK managed to retain uh, its... Uh, 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 um, um, position in government for over uh, for about a decade and uh, returned uh, uh, to government soon after uh, and I would argue that uh, this was largely to uh, due to the success that it had uh, enjoyed uh, already at its very early years and I will explain this in more detail. Um, so I am going to zoom primarily in the period prior to the ascendance of PASOK, as well as the 1980s, which is probably what we, we could characterize the golden age of PASOK, uh, as I want to look, first of all, at the genealogy of PASOK, how, how it emerged, uh, what factors uh, uh, contributed to its success. Now, I cannot offer a comprehensive account because uh, uh, there is not one or a couple of, uh, 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 I would say, conditions that uh, have, have uh, enabled PASOK to become a successful uh, contender and eventually uh, party in office. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look uh, a little bit in uh, the realm of culture, first of all, which has been relatively under-researched, and try to, to show that uh, some of the themes the idiom that PASOK has used uh, uh, in, uh, uh, already uh, from uh, its time in opposition in the 1970s, late 70s, uh, have roots into cultural developments in Greece that uh, were already underway uh, during the 1930s and afterwards. Uh, so, uh, before I go into these details, I will have to... Uh, uh, in, uh, engage a little bit with the literature of uh, uh, populism, primarily the way I, uh, I see populism, how I define it and how I will operationalize it in this, in this paper. So the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, uh, a lot of critics of uh, uh, people who see populism in negative ways as a, uh, a way, a, a mode of conducting politics that uh, 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 regardless of the left or right-wing language idiom that this is using, um, uh, is eff effectively regressive and problematic. Uh, so a lot of critics are arguing that whoever criticizes populism effectively are uh, trying to stifle uh, a, a positive assessment of uh, politics, uh, uh, popular politics. Uh, that have been deployed by many political parties in history and so on. Uh, I beg to differ because I think uh, this critique is uh, in some ways uh, trying either to ignore nuance or trying to evade uh, nuance. And I would say that uh, effectively uh, the popular, any evocation of the people is not necessarily uh, a democratic one, is not an emancipatory one. And I would uh, try to uh, later on forward a definition of populism that emphasizes its uh, anti-democratic democratic or counter-democratic uh, uh, elements and dimensions. So, but uh, on the other hand, I would like to acknowledge that uh, uh, not all evocations of the people in politics are negative. So I have here, uh, first of all, I owe the in some ways, the inspiration into looking, uh, of looking into populism to uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who has been arguing already uh, uh, in the 1960s that uh, defining the people uh, uh, and using the people also in political and other uh, fields is a matter of uh, struggle, primarily among intellectuals, but later on also among politicians. Uh, and I would argue that uh, 
Of course, there are a lot of vernacular ideologies. There are uh, uh, symbols, discursive traditions that emphasize the people as a subject uh, in social and political development. But these I treat as blank banners, as banners that uh, uh, do not provide us any particular political direction or even cultural direction uh, uh, until uh, they become articulated in political discourses. So uh, pop popular politics can become something that is positive, but they can also become a license to some demagogues or political parties to restrict uh, the political terrain. So assuming that uh, there is a discursive field that uh, is uh, focusing on the notion of the people, I would argue that uh, uh, out of this, we can have understandings of the popular, of the people, as a diffuse fluid field where identification and diversification overlap with each other. So where you can identify as a member of the people, but you can recognize diversity and difference within the ranks of these people in many ways. And this process is a process of continuous negotiation. That I would consider uh, what uh, is a minimal definition of a democratic uh, popular politics. On the other hand, we can have the popular as the product of what uh, Theodor, Theodor Adorno called identity thinking. So effectively, uh, 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 bringing uh, in some ways a sense of homogeneity, avoiding uh, attention to uh, diversity, particularity, and so on, and uh, therefore uh, a, a kind of politics that is averse to difference and diversity. That, for me, is where populism, uh, effectively, the root of uh, definition of populism lies. Uh, so, very quickly, I would try to uh, 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 discuss a little bit uh, uh, characteristics of populism. Uh, populism has usually been juxtaposed with liberal democratic politics. So, the, the democracy, the populism is supposed to be promising for many authors is a non-liberal democratic one. I wanted to bring some nuance in this because I don't think all critics of populism that uh, support democratic poli politics or the potential of democratic policy politics has to do, have to do with uh, uh, um, considering liberal democracy as the uh, uh, only viable alternative. I would say that liberalism and populism in many ways have gestated in the transition from absolutist to more democratic governance uh, uh, several centuries ago, and I would argue that both are based on abstractions. Uh, and these abstractions have to do with their understanding of who the main bearers of, bearer of rights in, in each uh, uh, democracy, visualized democracy, is. So I would say that uh, effectively liberalism has been looking at the uh, uh, individual citizen as the bearer of rights. And uh, uh, however, it has been looking at the citizen uh, as an abstraction. So effectively, and contemporary critiques uh, of uh, liberalism uh, try to um, document this uh, in uh, a lot of detail, effectively the citizen of liberal democracy is uh, a, a citizen that bears rights as long as they don't bring their social, cultural, identity uh, elements in the political terrain. So as long as they do not uh, effectively bring issues of identity and difference. Um, populist visualizations of democracy do something similar, but with regard to another uh, bearer of rights, because they consider that the bearer of rights is a collectivity, a collectivity that we usually call the people. So uh, what is the abstraction? The abstraction is that uh, effectively, uh, this people is an entity, and yes, uh, I, I uh, use this slide now. It's an entity uh, that is hard to define in many ways, and uh, also hard to decipher. Its voice, it's not clear. We cannot consult the, pe the people if the people is homogeneous, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the diversity of voices that exist within the popular uh, are negated in many ways, are ignored. Uh, so, uh, populism looks at the people as the exclusive bearer of rights at the expense of particularistic and individual rights. Uh, this, this, in many ways, is based on this abstraction that the bearer of rights is a kind of an anthropomorphic entity 
that is homogeneous and uh, which has one voice only. Uh, so I would uh, argue that in both cases, we have an amputated notion of democracy that uh, uh, doesn't allow uh, nuance and doesn't allow diversity in it. So this is effectively what I will uh, work on during the rest of uh, my presentation. Now, this, uh, this unity of the people, I argue, and I will not uh, dwell on this uh, too much, but I use the psychoanalytic co concept of projective identification, effectively the projection of undesirable feelings, uh, bad feelings to an external, bad, impure, hostile, antagonistic other. So the people has enemies and these enemies uh, are effectively the field on which all the bad uh, uh, memories, feelings, and uh, also uh, uh, feelings of lack are projected in many ways. Uh, also, populism is not the product of a crisis, but quite often, I would argue, is, uh, has central in it the process of construction and articulation of injustice, of crisis frames, of trauma, uh, what I mean by that, it's not that crises do not happen, but it is how populism articulates this crisis in a way that they are conducive to the uh, emergence of a people that has one voice and requires uh, particular political solutions. This exactly leads to a binary visualization of politics uh, that uh, 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 sees both the, uh, the people and the other or the enemy of the people as uniform homogeneous entities. And this happens through the mobilization of discursive traditions, uh, collective memory, and of course, through political and public debate and cultural production, which I'm going to focus on in a few minutes, I promise. Um, that's the last slide that has to do with uh, my operational kinds of uh, definitions. So I would say that uh, uh, an emphasis uh, on extra institutionalism in action and representation is a hallmark of populist politics. So instead of uh, 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 trying to develop institutions that can uh, uh, hear multiple voices, can understand and perceive and, uh, and translate nuance in society, uh, we have a number of institutions that are extra institutional and uh, uh, mostly plebiscitary. So they are uh, you know, when the people with one voice approves a specific political outcome. And these uh, you, uh, can be summarized as uh, forms of what I've called in different studies I've done as street democracy, governance through protest, performative politics. Um, and finally, uh, quite often, uh, and many people think that this is indispensable to populism, uh, I think it's a frequent element of uh, populism we usually have forms of paternalistic leadership, often personalistic, charismatic, that uh, primarily derive their validity and their currency outside the state. And as I uh, finish this, I will go back to the 1960s, effectively. Uh, I, I, I think we're all familiar with the, the 19, late 60s, 1967, uh, uh, Greece's, I would say, fragile democracy and imperfect democracy was uh, uh, interrupted by a group of generals who attempted to invent and normalize a particular kind of understanding of who they were, where they came from in many ways. So uh, I'm arguing that a a systematic use of the term people in politics uh, in many ways can be already seen in 1967 and afterwards when uh, the generals tried to effectively emphasize that they were the offspring, the outcome of uh, uh, um, the people in many ways, that they express the will of the people. This had to do uh, partly uh, in their angst, as I hope call it, uh, I use a sociological definition of angst, I will not go into this at the moment, but uh, effectively uh, they were generals, they were not generals, it was expected that there was going to be a coup by generals at the time, a more established, more educated, more uh, uh, with more experience in dealing with the elites of political, economic elites of the Greek society. The generals were much less, I would say, adept into the politics of, of the time, and they felt like a fish out of the water in terms of how they related to the elites uh, of uh, Greek society. 
And therefore that created a sort of angst, a sort of need to, to, to convince elites and people that they had the right to usurp power and uh, continue governing Greece. Um, and at the same time, I think that their emphasis on the people had to do with uh, all, already ongoing processes of defining and reimagining the people in Greek society, which I'm going to go to in a few minutes. But I want a little bit to dwell on the uh, um, way that, that the generals have been looking at the notion of the people. So uh, uh, you may have seen a lot of photographs of uh, uh, especially George Papadopoulos on, on the left, uh, on, uh, sorry, on, on the right of the screen, the left of the screen, <laughs> uh, dancing uh, on various occasions, actually, wherever he would uh, uh, visit, wh whatever place, uh, uh, military camps, uh, during Easter uh, holidays, uh, various events uh, that uh, uh, so-called impromptu events where the people would, uh, uh, of a particular city or locality would uh, uh, come to greet them and so on, they would always uh, uh, have a dancing occasion and they would primarily dance dances that uh, in Greek we call Vimotika, Tragudia, uh, and uh, uh, folk dances, effectively. Uh, and that was the music of their preference that probably had to do also with the rural provenance and, and the domination of uh, this folk music in uh, uh, the countryside. Um, but they also liked uh, uh, other types of entertainment. So, for example, uh, they have, first of all, an encouraged very much what in Greece we would call the music played, uh, uh, the, the tabuzukia, as we say, particular music. And uh, they would occasionally be feature, uh, appear in these places. And uh, actually they, they, the wife of George Papadopoulos, uh, uh, who uh, was very fond of this music, uh, it is legend says that uh, had uh, uh, been offered a song by Yanis Kaladzis about her husband, I don't know if I can, if the sound works, but there was a soundtrack of this. Never mind. We don't uh, mind about this. So, uh, but of course, uh, the cameras also went to the movies. And uh, what did they do during uh, these kinds of outings? No, the, they, they supported effectively a film industry that was not, uh, that didn't uh, uh, refocus its production very much. Apart from the fact that most of the uh, movies that they favored were militaristic and they tried to exalt the nation and its military values. But on the side of this, there was a genre of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, film that uh, they also favored. And uh, uh, this effectively uh, was based on the idea of a popular hero, of a hero, sorry, from the people a humble person usually that managed to uh, take the route to, uh, of upward mo mobility and uh, managed eventually to marry well, to uh, get a fortune and get out of the misery of uh, uh, poverty in many ways. This was more or less the promise that the dictatorship was trying to, uh, uh, to give to the, the, the people in turn, in, in turn uh, to their uh, deference in many ways, in terms of the deference they would provide opportunities from upward social mobility. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, notion of the people was not the only one that was uh, at the time uh, being articulated in Greek society. As a matter of fact, uh, there was, I would say, a concerted effort, uh, very, very diverse, but also concerted effort to rethink Greek history and uh, try to create a notion of the people that fit in that history uh, in ways that uh, had not happened before. So not patriotic in the sense of uh, militarism and uh, 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 archaeolatry, as we call, uh, as we call it, uh, uh, you know, excessive veneration of the ancient Greek tradition, but something else. I have here, eventually, yes, I have here an extract from Odysseus Elitis, uh, 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 Tadimosia Hepaidiotica, where uh, uh, in, uh, because there is a lack of good translations, I translated this and I think that uh, I, I have tried to be quite faithful to the gist of what he says. And you can see here that he talks about the people and uh, he juxtaposes the people with uh, uh, 
uh, the people who came with diplomas and laws, so modernity in Greek society, uh, who destroyed effectively the traditions and culture that the people had been religiously uh, uh, and with devotion trying to uh, maintain. And uh, he's arguing also that uh, uh, apart from robbing the people of the remnants of their script, and on the other, knowing a way at their very essence, they socialize them. Uh, this is a term that was used quite often at the time. We turn them into yet another petty bourgeois staring at us bewildered from a little window in an Egaleo apartment block. Now, uh, uh, I think Egaleo apartment block is very crucial here. So I just had a map of Attica and uh, uh, a view of Egaleo to show you where this petty bourgeois out of which windows was looking at uh, uh, the, the uh, learned uh, Greek uh, elites that uh, came to uh, effectively help him, help them, and so on. So this is an area that is uh, uh, one of the most, uh, I would say, polluted and uh, overbuilt, uh, anarchically overbuilt areas of Athens. Uh, and uh, that's what elitists try to emphasize here. So um, I, would, uh, I would say that the elitist, of course, was not thinking about politics at that time, although politics were imbued into his uh, uh, writings, effectively. But I would like to say that the uh, elitist is, is iconic in many ways of uh, a cultural politics of the period that tried to, uh, um, uh, I would say, put uh, at center stage uh, the condition of abjection that characterizes the people. Uh, so the people defined as the repressed, outcast, uh, that was a common theme in cultural production, even before the, the Kenrods, actually. Uh, and uh, in many ways, it uh, also tried to, uh, cultural discourses tried to articulate different types of abjection that I will try to talk about in a minute. And eventually, I would argue that in the late 1970s, uh, all these themes were articulated in politics, largely, but not exclusively, by PASOK. So I won't go through the, uh, go through the details of this, but I would uh, try to say that one of the cases, and there are many that I will not uh, have the time to talk about, was the, uh, in many ways, the discovery or rediscovery of Rebetiko music. Uh, Rebetiko was uh, music that came from Asia Minor after the uh, uh, Greek uh, state and the, and the newly born uh, Turkish uh, Republic signed an agreement of uh, compulsory population exchange. These objects, in many ways, arrived in Greece, were not received well. They were received sometimes negatively, uh, uh, called Turkospori, Turkish seeds. Uh, and uh, uh, they inhabited primarily areas uh, 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 in seaports, in, in Greece's seaports, uh, some other areas that were underused uh, near the major urban centers. And at the same time, their music, uh, uh, sorry, and their music was, uh, uh, became the soundtrack of these areas uh, in, in, in many ways, or uh, the soundscape of these areas. Um, at the same time, a lot of the, of, of the people who uh, 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 either were associated with the Rebetica or who uh, continued composing music in this style uh, were associated with the uh, various uh, practices that uh, uh, rendered them, uh, gave them the label of subculture. So a lot of them were petty criminals, a lot of them uh, uh, engaged in hashish consumption and so on. And therefore the music was looking down on uh, and uh, 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 negatively. Um, there was a progressive process of integration of elements of this music uh, already in the 1950s. Uh, uh, Manos Hadzidakis and Mikis Theodorakis used a lot motifs and, and instruments used in the Rebetica. But we can see that uh, uh, in the late 60s and the 70s, uh, Rebetica becomes something else. There is a lot of work, musicological, linguistic, anthropological studies. There is a lot of emphasis on Rebetica becoming a an exemplar of uh, traditions of rebellion, as they call them. Uh, a, a lot of young artists formed uh, uh, companies. I have counted today 200, uh, which were small bands that were uh, singing authentically as they, they claimed Rebetica. And uh, uh, eventually, as I would say later, Pasok embraced this music of the, out the outcasts uh, as one of the uh, 
uh, types of music that uh, uh, effectively express popular um, uh, will, suffering, objection, and so on. And I have some pictures, but I... Uh, so, um, but uh, also it was not only music. Uh, uh, cinema became also an area where uh, the uh, people uh, were constructed in many ways. Uh, and uh, this happened in two ways. Either there was a, a, a development towards a departure from dominant uh, uh, motifs and mo uh, uh, dominant tropes, and of course of the type of light entertainment that I showed you earlier, or there was a more uh, a critical look at history and focus on issues of identity and social ju justice in cinema. Uh, these sometimes overlapped, uh, these sometimes were different, but uh, uh, it is in this context that we have the emergence of a cinema, auteur cinema primarily, but uh, with also some popular, I would say, uh, uh, following that uh, try to deal with these issues of history of uh, the Greek society. And, and here I have some examples. For example, this is a, a, a Petrina Fronia, Stone Gears uh, by Pandelis Bulgaris. Uh, about the civil war. Uh, uh, then there's uh, uh, Megalexandros, which is uh, one of the many movies of Theo Angelopoulos, whose anniversary, his, uh, the, the anniversary of his death uh, was two days ago. Uh, uh, and this was not by design here. But uh, also, Lachis Fatastatis, Tongeroton and Linon, uh, the time of the Greeks. Uh, Othiasus by Angelopoulos, the reconstruction of by Angelopoulos, but also mo movies by comedians like Thanasis Vegos of the time that tried to uh, portray the underdog in uh, positive ways. Um, and now I will go re reasonably quickly because I chose one aspect of the new Greek cinema, and that was uh, the emphasis it gave to what I call rebels with a cause. So effectively, there was a kind of genre of, uh, that focused on banditry. And uh, this, was, of course, had to do with uh, also a, a quite popular 20th century kind of penny literature or even serious literature. Uh, and as I said, this is a, a movie by Lakis Papastakis, Tongeroto Nelinon, which effectively situated in uh, uh, the eve of the year uh, 1900. And it's a film at Cape Sunion, where a, Greek, a group of brigands or bandits are abduct, abducting a group of uh, foreign uh, visitors. And they ask for a ransom. And the usual story upon which this is based is that the ransom eventually would be a Robin Hood style, uh, trickling down to local communities and uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the abject people. Not always the case, but uh, that's the story. So uh, these are these these are juxtapositions that you can see how the Western dressed Europeans are there and how the bandits are dressed. Uh, quite a lot of critics have said that this uh, imitates in many ways the aesthetics of Theophilos, uh, a popular naive painter. Uh, he was not a naive painter, but he was painting naive painting and. Uh, um, uh, others have said that uh, they uh, present also, they, these are uh, emulating popular lithographies and so on. Uh, this is uh, another uh, movie that focuses on bandits, and this is uh, Omega Alexandros by Theodoros Angelopoulos. And uh, uh, Angelopoulos uh, has uh, had much more success than Papastatis, whose uh, movie didn't really uh, become a, a, box, uh, a box office hit. But uh, nevertheless, uh, they both at the same time, the movies came at the same, on the same, in the same year, uh, uh, is looking at uh, uh, Mega Alexandros as the leader of a group of bandits and the relationship with a, a local community in somewhere in Greece. Um, now, all of these movies and a lot of others that I don't have time to talk about focus, uh, uh, first of all, on popular literature, but also they have links with folk tales and traditions. So if you see here, uh, Megalexandros, uh, he looks very much like uh, St. George in uh, popular iconography. He also looks like uh, Megalexandros in the Karagios tradition where he is a popular hero. Uh, he also looks like a lot of other incarnations of Megalexandros. 
and it's quite interesting. So this is a popular lithography that uh, has a, a, a likeness of Mera Alexandros. This is Karagios. And uh, this is Aris Melichiotis from the Greek Civil War, uh, one of the left heroes of uh, 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 the Civil War on a white horse, uh, very similar posture that is repeated time and again in the movie. Uh, uh, there is a symbolic politics in these kinds of movies uh, that, that uh, try to link different traditions and different moments in Greek history in, uh, uh, by recounting, narrating the history of uh, these, these heroes. Uh, and I will just stop uh, 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 referring to movies and uh, go to the final part of my presentation. Just trying to say, to say that this is a uh, uh, Meg Alexandros uh, posing in front of a depiction of St. George killing uh, the dragon in many ways. And this is at the very end of the movie when Meg Alexandros uh, uh, shows in many ways authoritarian tendencies and uh, also fails to redeem. And therefore, there is a, a moment where the people, the community, goes over his body and effectively does what uh, uh, Jan Pot uh, has called uh, eating the gods. They dismember him and eat him. And when they retreat, there is no one there. There is no trace of Mega Alexandros in many ways. Uh, so the themes I found in the movies, but primarily in Angelopoulos, were the figure of the Redeemer in Mega Alexandros or a bandit, the failure of redemption, and a frustrated unity of the Redeemer and the people that leads to the effectively the punishment of the leader. Uh, so in many ways, I think these are tropes of this, describing popular politics in Greece for uh, the 20th century, for du the duration of the 20th century. Um, how have these been uh, um, translated into politics? First of all, uh, all, all these traditions and a lot of others that I don't have the time to go through, all these uh, narrations, uh, effectively supported the binary visualization of politics, the abject people and those who made them abject, those who made them suffer in many ways. And uh, of course, this is based on verification and homogenization of both people and the enemy. And uh, uh, a construction through this of an injustice or crisis frames, or injustice or crisis frames, or uh, the rehearsal of a collective trauma. Uh, so I have gone through the publications of the time uh, from uh, 1969 to uh, 1978. And uh, uh, there is a boom in uh, publications that uh, focus on primarily tocatestimeno, as we say, the establishment in, in uh, Greek politics, but also different versions of this. This is a small indication of the uh, plethora of uh, publications of this, but they are also contribute to uh, uh, articulating all these uh, diffuse themes that uh, we see in cultural uh, uh, developments in, in, into a more, po more politi explicitly political kind of context. Um, I will not go through this uh, in detail. I would like to say that uh, effectively, uh, PASOK comes at that time and in many ways uses extremely, uh, uh, I would say, with extreme aptitude the, uh, the, these themes that uh, were becoming ambient, so the light motif of politics in Greek society. And he tried to transform grievance or aspiration into injustice. Uh, he tried to uh, activate various socio-political fissures that existed in Greek society. And uh, he talked a lot about the sovereignty of the people. And of course, he, he utilized and constructed crisis on the basis of these. Uh, I would say that the major three, although there are many more, uh, were the national schism, uh, the division between monarchists and uh, republicans in the beginning of the century, the 20th century, uh, the Asia Minor disaster, and the, uh, uh, I would say the uh, road to Xenikia um, or exile of uh, the, uh, the Greek refugees. And at the same time, the Greek Civil War. I think these were themes that were dominant in the discourse of PASOK. I don't have time to go into details, uh, but uh, one can see very frequently in the discourse of Andreas Papandreou these moments. And so in many ways, I would say 
that all these three uh, effectively become an, a key element of constitutive violence in Pasok's uh, 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 view of politics in Greece. So Pasok, as I mentioned before, posits the people as the bearer of rights. So if you see many of the posters, many of the discourses, uh, this says uh, power uh, is derived from the people, expresses the people, serves the people. Uh, then, uh, he, as I said, brings multiple injustices and multiple claims into the picture. So here is one about the national resistance during the civil war and so on. And then uh, Pasok takes the role of effectively of Megalexandros uh, as a redeemer. So we can see all these posters here, for example, that are based on a particular trope. The people want, Pasok can. So Pasok will redeem because the people want. It's this kind of plebiscitary politics that I, I, I have been talking about. Um, and it's very interesting that it's cast as the redeemer uh, uh, versus the people. And I would say, for example, that uh, the ex-institutionalism of PASOK, that doesn't have to do with the cultural developments, uh, has been very, uh, I would say, succinctly uh, encapsulated by Costa Simitis in Domitia di Politevsi. Costa Simitis is a, a very respected po politician in Greece, uh, but uh, his book is a, a plagiarized version of the transformation, uh, that the, the Democratie, sorry for my German, uh, by Johannes Agnoli, that uh, was, uh, a hit in the 60s. And it's about extra institutional consent uh, mechanisms, extra institutional politics, not trusting the institutions of the state, what I, I mentioned before. Uh, at the same time, street democracy, use of rallies, etc., and representation through the display means. Uh, I, there is a video here, but I don't know how to show that. Uh, and maybe that's even better because it will allow us more time for uh, uh, discussion. So I would argue, uh, what was the purpose of this talk? Primarily to fully understand the success of PASOK, we should not see PASOK as coming out of nowhere. We need to look at the genealogies of populist movements. We can see that with re reference to other populist movements, but uh, of course, uh, PASOK is a very good uh, case uh, in point. So we need to situate populist movements within a broad, broader constellation of memory, history, uh, cultural processes, and so on. In the case of PASOK, what it has done, it solidified and institutionalized particular versions of Greekness. It also popularized them because some of the cultural developments of the time were not accessible necessarily to uh, everybody in Greece, although they became quite uh, popular. So, and it has also privileged particular versions of history and memory. Uh, it was a uh, uh, repetition here, but anyway, it, uh, it was rooted on, uh, the, sorry, the notion of the people was rooted in Greek politics largely due to the efforts of PASOK at, at the time. And it provided a model for binary extra institutional politics that survived, outlived the time of PASOK and which Syriza in uh, uh, the, the next century uh, drew upon extensively to the point that uh, Alexis Tsipras, the leader of uh, Syriza, has been quite often been accused of plagiarism, plagiarizing Andreas Papandreou. So thank you very much for your patience, and I hope that uh, this was an interesting kind of glimpse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, this topic, uh, I saw especially interests me as hero of note because I was in Greece in 1981 when Pasov was first elected. I was just an undergraduate student, I knew nothing. Uh, but I did notice, the, the, and, and in a sense for me, it was an indication of the success of the newly formed Greek democracy, that there was actually a change in government from new democracy to Pasok, um, successfully done after uh, new democracy had ruled since the end of the junta in 74, 75. Yes. And uh, so um, cause for celebration that there could be, without violence, mm. Greece had known lots of violence. Um, and, um, and, uh, 
Yeah. And yet there was still the presidency in the hands of new democracy and, and happened during which prime minister. So there was a kind of mixing of these two. But I wondered uh, uh, if Tassoff has this kind of populist thing, then new democracy must be identified with the elites that against which and, and I, I'm wondering is that still true because Carlo Mies is still extremely popular yes uh, so yeah. and, oh, oh, how, how are you understanding those things thank you yes I, th I think that uh, the advent of PASOK in many ways changed uh, the parameters of political debate in Greece and has contributed to turning Nea Democratia for what we call a cultural party to a more populist party as well. Uh, so in many ways, uh, we can see that uh, both parties, actually PASOK has been much, much smaller in the past few years, so I cannot really talk about it. But uh, PASOK uh, at its heyday and uh, Nea Democratia, uh, I would say after the first decade of PASOK has uh, have become in some ways uh, fields, uh, context of cohabitation of different powers, uh, different forces, social forces, some of which uh, in both cases belong to elites eventually, and some uh, were uh, less, I would say, um, privileged uh, within a social and political and cultural kind of contexts. Uh, what I would argue was that the perception, however, and this is the success of PASOK, was that uh, uh, PASOK was the party of the people and Nea Democratia was the party of the elites, which is still persisting, interestingly, uh, whereas both parties in many ways have benefited from elite membership and support. So this, this is the, the, the success. The success is that, uh, of course, these are cultural parties and they will include uh, diverse forces in them. Uh, maybe Nea Democratia with more access to, uh, I would say, elites and the resources. But uh, it is the representation of one of these two parties as being still the party of the, uh, uh, the poor people, the abject people in some ways. We have, the, I'm not saying the politics have remained unchanged, but I think that that uh, kind of uh, uh, narrative has been resilient for quite a long time. But uh, I, I'm sure that other people may have different views so we can explore them, I don't know. Alos, Laos. The other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Nina? Um, so really interesting way that you incorporated film into this broader discussion. I'm super I'm almost really, really interested in the way that popular culture affects the broader culture mm. and political culture and vice versa. Um and it's interesting that you focus on a lot of non-classical influences because a lot of the Greek films that I'm familiar with from that point in time are classical reimaginings, like especially all of Michael Takayas' films. Oh, yes. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the way that those, you know, Greek tragedy state screenings and whatnot are influenced by this broader political discussion. And yes. if the mm. movies that aren't classifying are focusing on other time periods on purpose. Yes, uh, thank you, yes. There was an element in this talk that I thought uh, I should uh, just uh, uh, omit, uh, uh, and that refers to the generation of the 30s, uh, which brought a sea change in the ways that uh, I think Greekness has been reimagined in Greek culture, in, in culture. So the generation of the 30s effectively rejected, I would say, this uh, veneration of classical antiquity, not not uh, rejected it, but uh, I would say wanted to downplay it considerably. And uh, uh, this had an effect, I think, initially in literature and poetry, painting and so on. There was more emphasis on late medieval, early modern kind of uh, popular traditions uh, reworked. Uh, and uh, I think eventually it trickled down and became a theme in uh, uh, Greek cinema. So I think in the 1970s, we have, uh, apart from the uh, effort of the, the, the Greek di dictatorship to maintain uh, 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 movies with classical themes, we have a shift, a substantial shift. And Kakoyanis is, is an interesting case, of course, 
because he fits to the previous model. But on the other hand, uh, uh, he maybe have largely monopolized the continuation of that model in the era where other understandings of Greek culture had, had emerged as well. So I think there is, it, it doesn't disappear. And Kakoyanis was a, 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 an expert, a narrator that was the best place, one of the best placed ones to, to do that. Having said that very quickly, and I apologize for uh, overusing my privilege here of standing at the podium, uh, Omega Alexandros in many ways is considered to be uh, based on a notion of uh, an ancient Greek uh, tragedy, the Bacche, effectively. <laughs> Yes, so it's it's uh, it's it has themes of uh, you know the menads uh, uh, you know running loose in the forest and eating or uh, dismembering people and so on. It's there. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that continues, but it continues also articulated with this more modern culture. Uh, modern, yes, not not uh, antique culture in some ways. Did I answer some of what, of your question or? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I was watching um, the former finance minister of Syriza, um, Mr. Baroufakis, oh, okay. talk a few days ago. Um, and he was talking about how democracy in Europe looks like it's being lost because of all these populist movements in uh, in Europe, uh, the rise of um, the far right wing parties as, um, I guess, uh, in rebellion to problems that people think were not solved, um, which were caused by other continents too. I mean, you have the migration crisis that hit, you have um, countries that were, that were considered, I guess, comfortable and, but they couldn't foresee massive, massive changes that, um, that migration would bring. So, and I think one of the, another point that, that was brought on is um, the whole issue of a new type of leadership in the world with uh, technological feudalism too. So now I'm thinking with, these small parties in Europe, or rather, sorry, now in Greece, um, people are having a distrust now of just about every party that they, mm -hmm. you know, whatever whatever they believed in in the past, now everything that everybody's questioning. And they're also questioning, well, a few years ago, they questioned how families that, um, that were part of one political party, there was a succession of leadership, like dynasties. Okay, that happened in one party. Well, it also happened in a song. Well, now, okay, these other parties, like Syriza, et cetera, um, ha, what, what's their, their, their lifeline now? All these other little parties. So I was wondering if you could, um, you know, mm. you had opinions about that. Yes, there are quite many questions in that kind of, uh, yes. Um, let me go first to uh, the emergence of populist parties in, in uh, Europe and elsewhere, of course, India and so on. Uh, I think we can attribute this emergence to various crises, economic crisis, migration, as you mentioned, and so on. But uh, I also want to see crisis as being constructed, uh, having been trained as a sociologist primarily. And why am I saying that? Uh, quite often, it is how we deal with particular problems. So we have environmental crisis. It's our inability to deal with it sometimes that is the crisis that is articulated in politics as disappointment and as a cause of rage, perhaps, and indignation. It's our inability to deal with financial challenges uh, politically that eventually becomes the political crisis that uh, brings these parties. It's our inability to have a concerted the uh, uh, um, response to immigration that uh, has uh, created the problems that we had. So, for example, I lived in Sweden during the time of the Syrian immigration. Uh, Sweden accepted 110,000 Syrians. There were no problems until politically uh, there was no will, for example, to house them properly and so on. Why am I saying that? 
I'm saying that it's a, uh, what Varoufakis says in many ways, and I very rarely see eye to eye with Varoufakis, I must say, uh, is that, uh, um, and I think he's right, that we dealt in the wrong way with the problems that we encountered. So the rage is at the inability of political elites to give answers to the challenges of the time. And that can be very easily uh, uh, incorporated in a political narrative that is populist. You know, democracy doesn't work. We need a strong leader or a few strong leaders. Uh, we need the party that uh, uh, will uh, follow, uh, you know, a steady course and, and so on. Anyway, so I think that's that's uh, the first element. That, uh, so uh, that's uh, it's a failure of our political systems to really uh, address issues that are pressing, and therefore, uh, then you have processes of articulation. Um, in the case of Greece, I think we had, and that's also the success of the previous, uh, an older tradition, uh, which, which is effect effectively a clientelism, that uh, uh, that, uh, that clientelistic tradition managed to uh, allow specific families to reproduce themselves politically. And therefore, we have uh, uh, the Mitsotakis uh, uh, dynasty, the Karamanlis dynasty, the Papandreou dynasty from Pasok, but also Andrulakis in Syriza, in the, I'm sorry, in the precursor of Syriza, uh, was trying to also uh, position uh, his own offspring uh, in a position to continue. And of course, we have uh, Constantopoulou now, I don't remember his name, I'm really sorry, his first name. Yes. Uh, who is the daughter of uh, Constantopoulos, another leader of uh, Sinaspismos at the time. So we see that there is this kind of um, uh, sense of uh, legitimacy in uh, uh, positioning your offspring into politics. I think uh, uh, these families, new families of the left, do not have the currency yet or the, the, the skills to do that. But we can see that uh, in uh, PASOK and Nea Demokratia, these uh, elements are very strong. Uh, Yorgos Papandreou still continues being a suitor for leadership. And of course, in the case of Nea Demokratia, uh, the Mitsotakis family is planning a lot more uh, successors to the... Anyway, so that's... I think that this will continue until a crisis really undermines the system, which I don't see. Uh, in the near horizon. Well, Canada with its Trudeaus, which yeah. kind of yeah. completely mm. later. Um, are there other? Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. You did not mention two historical developments or processes that are, I think, key to understanding the rise of fossil. The first one was the uh, fragmentation or the crisis of the Greek colony movement uh, after 1968, uh, because Pasok was the first non communist left political party, left wing uh, political party in Greece. And the other one was the invasion of Cyprus uh, by Turkey. So uh, mm. you did not address these issues. Was it on purpose or? They were just marginal issues in your understanding, in your uh, yeah. framework. Thank you. That's a very good question. And also, thank you for giving the opportunity to just, uh, yeah. Uh, this was a, a, a very, I would say, narrow focus snapshot. Uh, there are a lot of things that uh, I have in my research on, uh, for example, ecology and ecological degradation. I, I also talk about the left, for example, why other left parties that use the notion of the people in elections concurrently with PASOK did not succeed uh, because PASOK managed to position itself exactly in this fractured field in a very kind of uh, 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 skillful way. Uh, but uh, I thought that this should remain for my book and not for this presentation. So <laughs> hopefully, yes, uh, I, 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 I could not for the good of me condense more what I had to say today. So I, I decided to avoid.
uh, and the, the, the Turkish uh, invasion or uh, <laughs> what is it, freedom, Operation Freedom or Happy Freedom uh, uh, is also an issue that also colored PASOK in a nationalistic way. Uh, it it uh, gave uh, permission to Papandreou to be also nationalist in his, uh, 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 not only anti-American, but also, so yes, I should have talked about anti-Americanism, but I wanted to focus on culture, so thanks. Yes, it also occurred to me a little bit that uh, in, in trying to frame what the elites believed in, that the fidelity to NATO and the Americans is one element, maybe the church is another element, mm. and so on. You might just have a list of such things yes. that, that, that clarify the issues. Yes. All chapters for your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Um, but just quickly, the I wasn't sure about um, when exactly each of these films was made, um, um, and could they be made during the junta? Or actually, it's quite interesting that the junta, again, as I mentioned, angst. They 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 tried to impose censorship, but they also wanted to show that they were going to be more. Eventually, they would be open to civilian rule. So a lot of the members of the Junta were complaining that uh, all these books that I mentioned, for example, uh, which were leftist books uh, and, and so on, were appearing at times when uh, 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 they were supposed to be ruling uh, and they were uh, fiercely anti-communist. The same also with films. So Angelopoulos starts uh, uh, his historical films before the, the, the Junta falls in many ways. So we have 1970 already production. But these films were 1980, were at the time when I think uh, the, 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 the films I mentioned, at the time when uh, uh, we were going to face an election and uh, have a change in government. But they were the culmination of processes that preceded the films. So we had already an emphasis on uh, uh, popular traditions of this sort, of rebellion. There, was, uh, there were a lot of books on traditions of rebellion at the time. And then they came as also uh, visual representations of that, uh, and uh, uh, and also Rebetico as a tradition of rebellion also emerged a little earlier. So 70s, I would say, was a very fruitful period for these kinds of uh, cultural adventures <laughs> and uh, endeavors, yes. More discussion, or should we uh, retire that they have some reservation for uh, pizza and beer and so mm. on over yeah yeah our new year's resolutions <laughs> <laughs> what resolutions <laughs> yeah. um, goes away but uh, uh, let me uh, again um thanks just very much for the talk and before we uh, have the last round of applause let me alert you that our next talk is on friday february the 9th and what you said about the 1930s not being, I mean, perhaps we'll hear about that. Catherine Lagos from Cal State Sacramento will be speaking, mm. and her expertise seems to be just in that period. So um, yes. we'll be able to fill in a little bit there. Um, yeah, so um, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.